seemed to me more concerned with her own performance rather than the basic issues, rather than quietly getting along with the job when they're in power. And so that I get just a little bit more cynical when they're sort of fighting for uh, winning an election. So you wondering basically if they don't really like concerned. any of them. Well, I'm just... That's, that's, that seems to be a common comment. <laughs> well, the com commentators are telling us it is anyway. I just wonder how concerned they are about real issues rather than just, you know, winning elections. OK. How much does cynicism and disillusionment come into this? Yes, you wanted to make a point. Yes, I think the problem is that uh, if we're not happy with either of the major political parties, Labor or Liberal, and we want looking at an alternative vote, and then we see that they're casting their preferences in a set pattern so that really the final result comes back to those two major parties and they're the ones that we're not totally happy with at the moment so where do we go because our alternative is set to those two parties also. Yes because it, it is a two party system no matter yes. what people think of the mm -hmm. Democrats or the Independents uh, one of those two major parties has to form a government after March the 24th. Yes. My, my discontentment arises from the fact that when Hawke came into power seven years ago he came in and said look it, the picture is a lot worse than what we thought it's going to, going to take us a little while longer to rectify the situation now seven years down the track and the pictures are a hell of a lot worse than at the time that he was saying it was pretty bad mm. and my discontentment is if he makes that promise then well what hope have we got with with another term of a Labor government now, the other side of the coin is, if you look at the Liberals, the Liberals haven't had any performance. They've been out of power for seven years. So there's nothing to, to judge what their performance will be like if they're elected to power. So one's left in a bit of a quandary. Doesn't know whether to go Labor or Liberal. And you don't really, at the moment, you're saying you don't really have confidence in either of them. No, that's And nor right. do you believe the Democrats can form a government. No, I don't believe they can. Yeah. Yes. I think the problem for <coughs> a large number of Australian people is that neither of the two major parties seems to have a vision of where this country should be going. They don't, they don't really offer any leadership as a government or a potential government. That's what I want to ask you. To what extent are you looking for new faces, new ways of doing things, new ideas? I mean, I, I get the impression that you're really saying to me that you, you, you're tired of the old parties and the way they do things, you're tired of the old uh, politicians and the way they do things, and you really want something fresh. Is, is that, am I right there? Yes. Yes. Am I, yes or no? Yes. 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 You wanted to make a point? Yeah. I think the problem is basically the Australian public is getting the type of politicians they sort of deserve. I think the public itself hasn't made up its mind what they want, and opinions are very much fragmented. And the major parties are feeling threatened by the minorities and they're jumping from one issue to the other. And that's why we're not seeing mm. a clear issue emerging in this election. Mm. Yes. I think, I think that it's grossly unfair really to say that, uh, that the electorate gets what it deserves. Um, there's just not enough options out there, that's all. Yes, because you were saying to me at the beginning that none of the parties mm. is idealistic no. enough to meet your aspirations. No. And I'm talking about really basic things too. Like what? Well, I'm just, I'm quite resentful of, uh, of, of the Hawke government in a lot of aspects. I mean, I'm really resentful of the higher education contribution scheme. That's irreversible now. And Are you I a student? Think, yeah, I am. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I am. And um, another thing that just really disturbs me too is just why our dollar was, was floated. That's, I mean, I don't, I, I mean, I can only talk in generalisations. Right. I'm not so politically astute as, as some of the other people. Yes, yes, you want to. In my opinion, Peter, I can't see why people keep knocking uh, governments that are in power because, I mean, if you go back through any government, everybody seems to knock that particular government that's in power. Why can't people say, well, it's a hell of a hard road to hoe anyway, you know, and give them all the support they need? Mm. But see, the trouble is a lot of you here, I mean, I know some of you have made up your minds, but you know, 36% is a lot of you who can't make a decision at this stage of the campaign about who you want to vote for. No, I think the boy's got something going for him, Bob. You do? <laughs> right, OK, you've made up your mind. Yeah. Are you having difficulty? Yes, I think it's also because there are so many issues that have become really prominent in this election. Like, I think this is the first election that the environment has taken such a high... Um, 
circumstance and same with um, economic management or mismanagement mm. as it may be. Yes, and, and, and the other problem is that at this stage of the campaign we haven't yet heard all of the party's policies on all of the issues. We haven't had the major policy launch from no, the No, there's been no party. analysis of the Labor Party's uh, uh, policy platform. So people platform. may be That'll waiting come tomorrow. to hear the full details before sure. they make up their mind. Can I? Yes. I think, Peter, if you look into the literature of change in the last decade, people like Fritjof Capra, the physicist, and, and uh, Sean McDonough, the, the theologian, and so on, people are pointing to the need for and, in fact, the, the, the appearance of change in people's hearts. And we're seeing it in Europe and we're seeing it all over the world. I think it's about to happen in Australia. And this, we're in a time of confusion at the moment. What, confu uh, and, what and, and politicians haven't even thought about it. In yet. a very subtle sort of way, going through a little political revolution of our own, out of which you hope that a new way of doing things will emerge. Is that what I, you're saying? I, I guess hope's probably the operative word. Big yeah. emphasis on hope. You wanted to make another yes. point? The, question, the, thing, the main point in our minds is integrity. And that that's not coming over from either party. There's a, for a case in point, uh, the Professor Norman and the other economic pundits are sort of saying we should have a, a broad-based consumption tax. Um, the National Small Businesses Council say we should have a, a broad-based consumption tax. Hawke says we won't introduce a small based, a broad-based consumption tax. Peacock said we won't do it. They've already done it. Mm. The tax on petrol is the biggest contributory factor to the, yes. the CPI. And you know, the stupidity is, people are starting to say, because the CPI has gone up, we should put the price of petrol up. It was petrol that put the CPI up. It affects every item that is in use in this country sure. today. Well, are you saying then that you've lost faith in all politicians, basically? You're not yes. too concerned about the ideology? Yes, John Cowell. Now, what does a market psychologist the have to say about uh, this? One of the problems people point to is that politicians nowadays seem to to pick out little individual issues, which unfortunately have been detected through market research, and throw a little bone to each one of these dogs. But there's no big picture. There's no vision of where we're going. There's nothing about the economy as a whole. If the roads, uh, there's a smash on the roads up in New South Wales, we'll spend more money on roads. If there's childcare, we'll spend money on that. They're handing out money in all directions but there's no big picture of where Australia is and where pe people yes. want it to go. I, mean, I was just going to say, Jeff Kitney, no correct feeling. me if I'm wrong, but if I were writing a piece about this tonight, I'd be saying that what people have told me is that they want someone who can inspire them, and they can't find anybody in the present uh, mix of politicians who can inspire them. Is that, is that right, do you think? Well, I think that's right. I think uh, uh, what people are saying here tonight is that there isn't much choice between the major parties, and I think that's true. Uh, we, it's a bit of, it's Tweedledee and Tweedledum in Australian politics at the moment. Um, there aren't really fundamental differences on the major policies, uh, policy issues. Um, so, uh, yes, I think that people feel that uh, they want some leadership and uh, they, they can't see that they're getting it from, uh, from the, the, the two uh, major parties at the moment, and that's why people are looking to the Democrats. I mean, it's extraordinary the number of people who, who are indicating an interest in voting for the Democrats, when the Democrats really have a rather fuzzy um, uh, set of policies, certainly a fuzzy set of economic policies for managing the problems of the country. Mm. And but no they, but they, but there is some sort of sense of idealism yeah. in the Democrats and what they're saying. Uh, people, I think, are seizing on that. Well, um, certainly, this is certainly what uh, at least one person is saying. No, I want some idealism and I'm not finding it. You wanted to make a point? concerned about the lack of funding in tertiary education. Um, I understand of the VCE students that sat in Victoria this year, fewer than 50% got a place in a tertiary institution. And I think this country has a particularly poor record in that regard. All right. Well, look, let, we'll, we'll talk about some... Yes, you wanted to make a point before yes, I, I move I was, on. Yes, I was going to say that um, we talk about the major parties all the time and we talk about uh, the leaders, you know, and it seems to have come down very much to a battle between one leader or the other. I wonder, um, in some electorates, I mean, I live in the, in the marginal seat of Flinders, um, conservation is a very strong issue in that area. There's a lot of development on the peninsula and people aren't happy about it. Um, people perhaps are voting for issues in, in their local area. Perhaps the, the local candidates are the ones they're going to decide on, not necessarily the major parties. All right, well you've perhaps that's where idealism comes in. Well, you've raised a very interesting point there. Let's talk about leadership and how you see the importance of the personalities of the leaders. And we might actually run a, run a little um, instant poll here to, to give us a talking point to start. If you just look at this question, I'm just interested in how you um, uh, perceive the, co the, uh, the, the political competence 
uh, of, of Hawke and Peacock as a straight comparison. Here's our question. If you just consider this for us, either Bob Hawke or Andrew Peacock will be Prime Minister after the 24th of March. Which of the two do you think is more competent to lead the country? And if you just indicate for us with either a one or a two. And the question we're considering here is either Hawke or Peacock will be Prime Minister after the 24th of March. Which of the two do you think is most competent to lead the country? And by 63% to 37%, you're saying that you think that Hawke is most competent to lead the country. Now, can you tell me why? I think the major problem is that we don't have a third choice. Um, no, <laughs> uh, and uh, that was deliberately so, if I might so, because there is us. no third choice on March the 24th. I think you're forcing us to we are. choose between Tweedledee yes. and Tweedledum, and I, I think there's a lot of people here who'd rather not choose either one. But of course the reality is on March the 24th you have to, don't you? I think that's... I mean, I know you're not voting for either Hawke or Peacock, but they are the only two people who I can become Prime I think the danger in this election that we're going to get a lot of votes for the minority parties as a, as a protest vote more than anything else. All right, well, we'll explore that a bit further on. Have you got a theory on why well, people... I think are... that the advantage that Bob Hawke could have would be that he's had some experience. We've already been through some turbulent mm. years, and if we're going to mm. come out of the, re the rest of the turbulent years that we've got to face, I think you're going to have to need somebody that's got some experience. Right, and so some intimate knowledge of the, of the problems that we're currently facing. So at least you know what you're getting with Hawke. That's right. Okay, yes. Well, in some degree you may be looking between Tweedledee and Tweedledum. What I think is that we know more about Hawke's team. His team has got a higher profile. Apart from Andrew Peacock and John Hewson, you're looking at the, the shadow faceless men. The rest, you don't hear much of them. Okay, mm -hmm. yes. You um, I think that... Uh, Hawke's got an advantage in that he has a, I believe he's got a more balanced view of what the issues are and I think that's uh, that's due in some part to the fact that he's married to Hazel Hawke. <laughs> and right. uh, I think Hazel has uh, has made an enormous contribution to the status of women uh, with, with the effect that she's had. And does that colour your perception of Bob Hawke? It certainly does colour my perception of Bob Hawke okay. and it certainly um, colours my perception of Andrew Peacock and the fact that I believe he doesn't have a particularly balanced viewpoint because um, he doesn't have uh, a, a obvious partner at the right. moment. Obviously. So Hazel keeps yeah. Bob in line and Andrew's got no one, he's just running wild. <laughs> 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 yes, you want to make a point? I, I think at this point there's a stark difference between the two options that we have. You've got someone who's been riddled with leadership problems throughout his, his time in opposition and you've got someone who's demonstrated that they can lead with some sort of direction and lead us the way that we should be going. Right, so when you're forced to make a choice, you say you see Hawke as, as the better leader of the two. Most certainly. Right. But I think, you know, we, we can't automatically assume that because Andrew Peacock has never done the job, he's incapable of doing the job. I mean, mm. you know, if you made that assumption, you'd never change governments. Mm. Well, yeah, well, that, well, right, let's talk about Andrew Peacock. Why, why did Andrew, when you're forced to make a choice between Tweedledum and Tweedledee, as you call them, why did Andrew Peacock come out with only about 37% of your support? Anybody, I, I don't think he's really been given a chance. <laughs> I mean, all of the media attention has been focused on Hawke because he's been making the decisions. Peacock hasn't had a chance. In fact, he's, he's not been the leader of, of the opposition for very long. So you, I think a lot of people here tonight uh, are saying Hawke would come out on top virtually because he's been in the limelight and it's better to, to deal with the devil you know and the devil you don't know. And that's not much of a decision, really. Uh, yeah. It, it, um the Prime Minister's quote is saying, and have you believed that it's a two-horse race between him and Mr Peacock? I mean, we're just discussing policies, and uh, the, the policies aren't being uh, c put across properly, really, by the media, because they're looking at this two-horse race. And uh, I think that there's a lot of merit in the fact, and a lot of people would say, that the policies over the last seven years have failed. But then again, Mr Hook's getting up and saying, well, it's between me and Mr Peacock, it's not our policies. There's some terrific policies out there to be grasped on and voted on. I think we should get with the media and get away from so much this uh, Mr Hawke and Mr Peacock effort and get on Yeah, well, I, I take your point. Yeah. I mean, the media does get obsessed with it personalities. Does. But uh, Bob Hawke has said this campaign is about leadership. You know, the most ele important election for 40 years and this is a campaign... It's also this is about a policies. Yes, you want... I, I believe that, that that's a lot of rot. It's not all about leadership. It's about policies. And the, the problem is that the main, the main problem we've got is a huge overseas debt that nobody's addressing up to this stage after 19 days in the, in the campaign. They're all tippy-toeing around it, as one of a friend up the back said, 
they're settling on smaller issues and ignoring the one large one. Mm. John Cowell, what, what do you make of the sort of things people have been saying about the two leaders? We've been trying to talk about the personalities of the leaders here and how people see their competence to lead the country. It's, uh, <coughs> it's partly their own doing, Peter. Remember in the old days we used to vote Liberal or vote Labor, and nowadays you vote for a Hawke government or a Peacock government, and they've directed all the attention on themselves. I think one thing we can say definitely is that a party without a leader who's recognised as being um, reasonably competent can't win. Mm. I'm not saying that the, it's all about leaders, but unless you've got a reasonable team leader, you're not going to win. So the, the fellow has to get up to that level first before he can get the next one. Yep. The other interesting thing that people might like to think about is how much they like the individuals apart from the, their competence in running the country. How is that a factor? In well, that? some people, some leaders don't worry at all about being like Margaret Thatcher, for example. I don't think worries whether people like her or not. I don't think most do. Other people can get away like Ronald Reagan just by being liked. I think he was marginally competent, if, if that. <laughs> um, well, so you mean the American electorate really didn't think that Reagan was the most competent person to run the country, but they liked him a hell of a lot. They loved him. He told great jokes. <laughs> and on that basis, they kept saying they preferred him as president. He, he performed very well. Yeah, well, look, let, let's, let's just put that to the test. Can we, can we just do, uh, I guess, some more comments from you. Can we just do another quick instant poll here? And we'll call this a sort of likability test. I just want to uh, see if you if make any distinction between competence and likability with the two leaders. Would you like to just consider this question for us? Regardless of competence, who do you like better as a person? Bob Hawke or Andrew Peacock? Let's give us a one for Hawke and a two for Peacock. And the question is, regardless of competence, who do you like better as a person? And our result is... Well, that's interesting because it's not exactly the same. You... Uh, a significant number of you feel that you like Peacock as a person, but uh, you don't really think he's the most competent person to lead the country. Can someone t tell me about that? Yes. I think it goes back to that old uh, issue that uh, came back from, from years ago. Uh, Bob Hawke, at least initially, was much higher on the charisma factor. I yes. mean, whenever you heard his name or saw his picture, it was always, you know, Mr. Charisma. I think it's worn off a bit, but there's still, I think, a hangover and element of that uh, affecting people's perceptions. Can you perhaps tell me why you think uh, Mr Peacock is less competent to run the country, lead the country, than Bob Hawke? I was going to follow up the other oh, point. All oh, right, we'll follow, follow <laughs> that up. I was going to I'll... say that Bob Hawke has had so much more opportunities than Andrew Peacock, as in the sporting area, he always makes himself seen with anyone who's succeeding. Yes, all right. Sure in that regard can, that well, can, can someone perhaps answer yeah. my question then? What, why do you think Andrew Peacock is less competent? Sorry, I was going to say something. Else. All right, you, well, go <laughs> ahead. I don't... <laughs> Aren't we getting away from the policies a little bit, though? Like, uh... yes, I, I, we'll get onto the policies in just a moment. I'm just interested in your perception of the leaders and their personalities and, and whether you think their competence to lead the country is a factor in this election. Yes, Max Yan. Peter, I think the, uh, the leadership issue uh, as Prime Minister, um, in all polls, historically, the Prime Minister always, <laughs> in fact, outvotes the opposition leader. And so what I think you saw here in this mini poll in your studio tonight was in fact reflected on the thing so that as a leader, um, he'll automatically most probably pick up, you know, 10 or 20 percentage points. So I think that most probably is the difference. So being Prime Minister does virtually put you into an election race with an advantage when you're well, considering this sort of discussion. Governments lose an election, they usually don't win them. All right. Just before we move on, can, can someone answer that question I, I, I posed? Why do you think Andrew Peacock is less competent to lead the country than Bob Hawke? Do you want to comment on that? Well, yes, I think he, he obviously lacks the experience that Bob Hawke had way before entering federal politics. He was the leader of the ACTU for quite a while. Now, I don't Andrew, think Andrew Peacock's, Peacock's been in politics since the year dot. Yes, but he hasn't that, had that strong positive leadership image, hasn't had a definite role to play that's clear in people's mind. He hasn't been dealing with clear issues and sort of winning. It's, it's, you know, he's been playing the political game, but he, right. hasn't, he doesn't seem to be an achiever. I'm not saying that's the case, but he, I don't think he appears that way. Well, I'm getting very strong messages here from people saying, why are we spending time talking about the personalities of the leaders? Why are we talking about policies? So I'd like to find out how importantly you rate leadership as an issue in the campaign. Could we just do another quick instant poll on this? Um, if you just look at the screen, we'll, uh, we'll put it into a question. Uh, if you just give an indication to us, once again, just give us a single response here, just give us a single number, but on a scale of one to nine, how important do you think leadership will be in influencing your vote on Saturday the 24th of March? 
and just give us a single number on a scale of one to nine. Give us an indication of how important leadership will be. Because see, most of us won't be voting for Hawke or Peacock, will we? We'll be voting for local candidates. So how important will leadership be in influencing your vote? And here we are. Now, that's a mixed response, if ever I saw one. <laughs> we've got, um, well, somewhere about the middle, we've got 18%, but we've got a significant number, 15% there, saying it's not at all important. 9% uh, saying it's very important, and 18% somewhere in the middle. So it clearly will be an influence in a significant number of your votes on March the 24th. So personalities will be a factor. I disagree with what you said about you know, the election being about uh, electing your local candidate. I think the way the whole election's been presented and the focus on the two individuals makes it a vote for the leader. I mean, it's almost uh, a case where the local representative is almost... Uh, irrelevant to the process. So you will make up your mind whether you like Labor, Coalition or Democrats or whatever on the basis of their leaders, will you? Absolutely. Anybody else comment on that? Yeah, I agree because I'm, I'm in Isaacs and I don't know, I know my outgoing um, <laughs> member, I don't know either of the ones that I'm going to be voting for. But you'll make up your mind once again on what the leaders present to you. The leaders and the issues. Yeah. I feel that it's a leadership um, fight because uh, the policies are going to be so close you won't stick a pin between them. So it's definitely a leadership thing. All right. Well, look, I think we should move... Yes, you wanted to make a point. You haven't um, had a chance to talk yet. I just wanted to make the point that the problem is that it is down to the leadership issue. But then both leaders are so bland, so uninspiring that you think, what can I do? <laughs> so you have to go back to the policies. OK, well, let's talk about policies then, because once again, <clears throat> in a little instant poll we did before we came on air tonight, you indicated to me that why and above anything else, uh, the issue of economic management was going to influence the way you voted on Saturday. So let's talk about economic management. Now, if you've been watching television or listening to radio, you'll know that we've been getting bombarded with competing claims, from certainly from Bob Hawke and from Andrew Peacock, about which of them has the answers. The facts are indisputable that in our period of seven years of government, we have achieved a rate of economic growth twice as fast as the rate of economic growth in the previous seven years of our opponents, and we have achieved a rate of employment growth five times faster than our opponents. We'll cut government expenditure, we'll reform the labour market, we'll carry out extensive reforms in areas like our transport system, which will get our costs down, we'll be competitive, productive again, and of course that means we'll be able to cut into our foreign debt, get inflation down and interest rates down. Okay, well that, that's, just a, that's just a titch of the competing claims that we're getting on the campaign advertising. It becomes a question of you deciding, I think, which of the major parties does have the answers. If at all, yes. Bob Hawke makes it sound like he does. He quotes numbers, makes it sound like he really has information, factual information. I tend to think Andrew Peacock generalises and says he will do good things, but uh, doesn't mention exact numbers, which I think uh, seems to, to make it seem less exacting in some way. So you're a bit suspicious of the Liberals' policy? Well, I, I think the Liberals' policy is perhaps less specific but I also am not really sure, as an ordinary citizen, I'm not really sure about the exactness of the numbers that Bob Hawke quotes to me anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so you're having great difficulty deciding which of them would is, is the better. Yes, uh, yes, you want to... Well, the other point on that is that uh, Bob Hawke's playing with numbers from the past, <laughs> quoting yeah. figures that have already been developed, and someone else is trying to quote a direction that they see. Mm. See, I suppose a sig significant thing that will weigh on, uh, on some of your minds anyway when you go to vote on March the 24th is whether or not you blame the government for the problems that we have. Do you? And, uh, you know, whether you, do you, is it a question of blaming the government? Is it a question of not knowing whether the Liberals have got the answers? Well, well I think the buck's got to stop somewhere to a certain extent. I mean, they're the ones making the policies. Uh, he talks about economic growth and talks about jobs, but, I mean, we, we're going into an area of a foreign debt we can't repay, and I think that... Uh, whether it's private sector debt or, or government debt, I think they're the ones that have really got to manage the, the whole economy that we can control it and, and we do the way they want us to, 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 to spend our money. Really. You're obviously concerned about the level of foreign debt. Oh, horribly concerned. I mean, we, we might be having good economic growth and good jobs, but we're about to be a banana republic due to our foreign debt. Is I mean, that a factor in any of the other... Yes. Very much so. Because I wondered uh, quite often, in fact, as I read about the level of foreign debt, whether these are such huge numbers they just go over the heads of most people. But you're saying no, you really are concerned about this. So foreign debt is obviously a very strong factor. John Cow? Peter, I just wonder from the audience how many actually know enough about economics to evaluate even something like the overseas debt, what percentage it is of GDP and all those sort of things. 
whether it is in fact um, a rational evaluative thing or whether, as I suspect, it's just a feeling that the, the figures are too high, the debt's too high and we're not going anywhere. Well, I, su I suspect it is a feeling, isn't is it? it? A feeling very or few is it, of us would be competent to assess it. Yes, you wanted to make a point? I think, um, being both an economics and a politics student, I think it's quite interesting to look at the issues over the years, say, take over the last 15 or 20 years of elections. And I think going on the figures that came out before, that's quite interesting to find that the economic situation doesn't rate with a majority of people as the most important issue. Um, if you look in the past, it would have been a clear majority economic situation. Yet now there are a lot of other factors that are coming into it, which people are considering, quite a considerable number of people are considering. Yes, although with this group here tonight, when we put up a range of issues before we started, you all said by a, a whacking majority that you thought economic management was the key issue. Um, is this, I mean, uh, th this question, I want to explore this a little bit further about whether it's just a gut feeling that you have that things are bad or that uh, one party or the other hasn't got it by control. I mean, you say you're really worried about foreign debt. Is that just a... Well, no, I mean, you look at the Bureau of Statistics figures. I mean, I think seven years ago, it was seven cents in every dollar that was in this country was required to pay off foreign debt. Now it's 25 cents in every dollar. And I mean, it's going to rise. And I mean, that's where I think we've got to really look at it. I mean, you don't have to be an economic student to be able to sit down, study the papers, and, and, really, and really sort of uh, get, get the grasp of what the problem is. And I mean, that's where I think um, we've got to look at it. Maybe people don't, this is where I think a lot of our problem is in our two people um, system where we vote for one person or the other. The, maybe the voter is a big ignorant in that, that yeah. area and we don't actually look at what's wrong with this country as a whole. We just look at who Bob, Hall, Bob Hawke smiles better than Andrew Peacock. Yes, but I know? gather from what you're saying tonight that a lot of you think that neither of them has the answers. Is that right? Yes. I disagree <coughs> that um, neither of them have the answers, but I'd like to make the point that in, when Mr Keating made his Banana Republic statement, that was 1986, same year, Mr Hawke goes on television and says our economic situation is difficult. In 87, we, the voters, gave Mr Hawke a mandate for change, particularly in microeconomic reform. To my knowledge, what sort of change have we had? Nothing. The economic situation is the same. The infrastructure problems are the same. The waterfront's still the same. And we're not giving our exporters any chance to compete until we get our act together in this country. You sound as if you're a business person. Well, I lecture in marketing at RMIT, and one of the areas I cover is export marketing. It's what I teach students. Mm. Well, how does this influence the way you assess this major issue? Who is best able to handle the problems? The well, economy? I'm having to judge a situation where we have had a government that's had seven years, and effectively four years since Mr Keating identified this problem, and it has basically said we should change, but seems to be dragging its heels. The opposition, although it's not in government, is promising radical change, and I must confess, I find that promise very appealing, particularly when you've got someone like Fred Cheney behind it. Mm -hmm. John Hewson. All right, John Hewson impresses you? Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Yes. All right, what other issues uh, are concerning you? When we talk about economic management, we're taking it a whole clutch of things. Interest rates, standard of living, cost of living, and so on. What, what else worries you? Yes, do you want to make a point? I'd like to make the point, following on one that was made before, that it depends a lot on what you know, how you judge whether or not you're being sold a pup. And that we're constantly being told about the high level of taxation in this country from the Conservatives. But in fact, if you compare our levels of taxation with those in some other countries, we're not highly taxed. And every time we're talking about reducing taxation, as far as I'm concerned, we're talking about reducing the funds that go to things like government schools, which is the yes. interest so, that so I have. But what are you saying here about the way people assess this, this crucial issue of economic management? I think people need a certain amount of background knowledge to assess whether or not they're being told the truth. All right. Yeah, well, look. It, we're certainly making the point that very few of us are economic experts and very few of us are in a position to make an expert analysis of the two competing policies. I suppose most people make their judgments in terms of the old hip pocket nerve, what it's costing us, what's happening to our standard of living, our cost of living and so on. Is that, is that a factor? To what extent is cost of living affected? That's exactly right. I mean, uh, I mean I'm just a lowly worker, but I've got a number of friends who on paper appear to be very prosperous but when it comes down to it, and you, don't, you know, they virtually haven't got two cents to rub together, they've got high, uh, you know, highly in debt. Um, a, a great uh, whack of their, uh, you know, pay goes to superannuation, mortgage, and, and all the rest of it. So, you know, bottom line, people who appear to be prosperous and ought to be wealthy, perhaps in the hundred thousand dollar a year area, really are quite, quite poor. It's the, you know, the hidden poor as opposed to the hidden unemployed or the hidden whatever. 
And, and that's does, this, where does this feed, I mean, how does this then spill over into how you judge who is best able to handle the problems that we've got? Well, I uh, fairly simple-mindedly uh, subscribe to the theory that the person that can promise me the most uh, will, will get my vote because I don't pretend to understand the economics of well, it. Well, at least you're honest. You are honest, and I suspect there are probably a lot more of you. Yes. Well, I'd have to be honest too and say that I'm no expert in the economic field, um, but I'd certainly have to take up this point. I don't know anyone in that wage bracket who I'd call poor. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I, I think that's, that's quite an amazing statement to make. Um, Perhaps I guess, not poor, but their standard of living has been reduced, to put well, it like. I suppose it's all relative, isn't it? Well, their standard of living has been reduced, but they're, they're certainly not poor. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the one of the issues, certainly, that's going to affect how I will vote, and, and I have decided how I will vote, uh, is an issue that's going to affect a lot of women and a lot of families, and it's an issue that hasn't been brought up so far tonight, and that, that is the, the childcare issue. Now, that's already been highlighted in the media as one of the cru crucial issues mm. in this election. That, that's because the two leaders are spending at least three quarters of every day kissing babies in childcare centres, <laughs> I suspect. <laughs> well, I mean, we've heard what the Labor Party is, is saying about what they're going to do with childcare. We've heard some bits and pieces about what the Labor Party is going to do. I would personally say there's huge differences in, in those two areas in that the, the Liberal Party is talking about tax rebates and, and so on, which I find quite amazing. All right, so childcare is certainly an issue and, and, and bo both issue. the major parties obviously yeah. think it is. Is this because it affects your standard of living or impinges on your standard of living? Well, it certainly does. I mean, if, if we don't have access to childcare, that means fundamentally that a lot of women don't have access to the workforce. Right. Now, the Liberal Party's talking about providing rebates, as I say, and the Labor Party's talking about providing childcare places. And so, so that's, there's some major concerns there in relation to access to the workforce for, for women. I'm really interested that nobody has mentioned interest rates. Now, yes. the media has been saying for a long time, interest rates are going to be a critical factor in this election. Not a single person has mentioned interest rates. As a matter of interest, could I just get an indication from you with a show of hands, how many of you have mortgages that are not uh, above 13.5%? Not a great many, but a significant number. So is this, uh, is this why interest rates haven't emerged tonight as a factor? Because as Paul Keating, Paul Keating keeps saying, look, it's only a minority of Australians that are, on, that are paying home mortgage rates in excess of 13.5% because most people have got that pegged rate. Is it a factor? doesn't seem to be. I think the, the issue is I think a uh, lot of noise is made about interest rates, especially on housing loans, but the majority of Australians either don't have a house of their own or they already own it. A significant proportion of the population already has paid off their house. Or because of the changing uh, mobility of the population, they have moved out of the old house and now taken on the new loans. Okay, look, there's something else I'd like to just throw into the discussion here because it does affect, uh, it affects certainly what we'd embrace as economic management. It certainly affects the standard of living that people have, the cost of living and so on. It, uh, Andrew Peacock says, he certainly said it in an impassioned speech during the debate, that Australia is now an unfair society. Would you like to just have a look at his quote and then I'd like to get your reactions to it. Australia has become an unfair society unfair to the great bulk of men and women, particularly working men and women. Now, the rich have got richer, the poor have got poorer, and that great bulk of Australians have not only just been squeezed out, they've been forgotten by Mr Hawke. Now, is that true and is it a factor in the way you see the problems of the economy? Yes, you wanted to speak? Yes, I feel that there's no longer any incentive for workers to say this work overtime. Like, they worked a Saturday and maybe Sunday and the tax at such a rate, which is hardly worth the effort. Yeah, so taxation is an issue incentive. in your mind. But at, uh, at the top rate of 49 cents in a dollar, I think um, every half a dollar is worth getting. And uh, if you're hungry enough, you'll uh, go out and do that overtime. Mm -hmm. Yes? We need to take this a step further. There's no incentive for skill in workers. It's not just a case of working hard, like you mentioned, but working smarter. People should qualify for pay rises in the workforce after they have gained additional skills on the job. That makes them a better worker, a more effective worker, a more productive worker. Oh. Jeff Kitney, what do you make of the sort of uh, different signals we're getting from the group here tonight on this question of economic management? Well, I think it's, it's pretty clear that people are very, very concerned about the future of the country and what's happening to the economy. 
It's also clear that they don't feel that they're getting uh, a, a clear indication from either of the major parties about how they're dealing with those problems. I think that uh, it's fairly obvious that they would like to have those answers. And I think that's the message to the, to the political parties from what people are saying here tonight, is to, to really to respond to those concerns, to spell out more precisely and more, perhaps more frankly, because I think one of the things we're lacking in this campaign, perhaps, is frankness, is a willingness to concede that there are still tough times ahead, there are still tough decisions to be taken, and that there'll be some pain for the gain that lies ahead. And I think, uh, I think what we're seeing is that, that people really feel that the politicians are, are, are really not taking them into their confidence. Is that, that true? Uh, Jim McClellan in the bulletin this week has written a little piece saying, look, I wish they'd just scrap all the economic jargon and talk to me in plain language that I can understand, because he clearly isn't able to make any sort of assessment of, of uh, who is best able to manage the economy. Is, is that a case? I mean, what Jeff has just said? Well, what, so, what, sorry, what, I'll go to the gentleman up here. He hasn't spoken oh, yet. What is being said is that, in relation, I'd say, in relation to interest rates, is that six months ago, 12 months ago, interest rates were going to remain high. They went up and on, which we go. All of a sudden, wonderful. We get an election, we can bring them down. And that, I think the Australian public is just sick and here, tired of hearing that electoral jargon being bounced around. Yep. You just don't believe it, in other words. No. Or do you believe that one or the other can bring a sustain... Uh, what's, what's Andrew Peacock's pace? There's not a massive reduction in interest rates. It's a, sust a significant and sustained reduction in interest rates. Oh, well, it doesn't spell out when. No, no. It'd be very hard to pin politicians down to a time scale. Yes, sorry, you wanted to make a point? Yeah, the problem, I think, is the economy requires a massive restructure, and, and that is really unpalatable to the majority of the electorate. And I think the, also the electoral system of these three yearly elections does not allow us any government to empower to restructure. to restructure because by the time they get in it takes them about a year to warm up to find their seat and then before they know it they have to start preparing for the next election and we get sick and sick of this but at the same time we've had referendums to change the system but the public does not want to change so I get back to an earlier point that I made we tend to end up getting the politicians that we deserve. All right, then just tell me finally, how do you go about making your assessment of which of the parties is best able to manage the problems of the economy? Because we have got horrendous problems, haven't we? Well, um, because I'm in the seat of Goldstein, really my view has got nothing federal to do with it because I'm a supporter of McPhee. There's um, nothing to do with it federally. I'm really, unfortunately, not interested in what they're doing federally. I'm voting for a view that McPhee should have been kept in. But I mean, Ian McPhee's not there this That's election, right, the, so you've still uh, got to vote. The Independent Liberal. Beg your pardon? The Independent Liberal. Right, okay. Standing. How do you go about making your well, assessment? I, I want to hark back a little bit, very quickly, to what the person said before. <laughs> where a lot of people really don't understand the, the economic questions. I think that most people would believe that the party doesn't, neither party wants to really sell the country down the drain. Um, I think that they feel that whilst one offers tax rebates or tax cuts, the other one will offer a reduction in interest rates, one way or the other, you know, it'll all be played off. That's why I wonder if that's where the cynicism comes in and, and, and where people are going to start voting for, for peripheral issues, you know, cons um, uh, the environment and, and uh, childcare and, and that and sort of thing. say the economy's too big for us and none of them have got the answer. I, I think partly that and because really they're not explaining um, what they're going to give us and, and I think people just, just feel it's too vast to understand so they'll concentrate on the smaller issues that, that make sense that to they them. they can comprehend. Yeah. Yes, you two people wanted to make, yes, at yes, the back I'd first. I'd just like to say this is probably the first election, even though I'm not very old, that I've never wanted to vote at all and I'll probably hand in a blank ballot paper Why in the next that? election. That's um, very sad. There's two, t two 2D figures in front of me, Peacock and Hawk. I want to vote for someone who's 3D. I want to vote for a real person. I mean, there's a lot of future ahead of me. Um, I don't see much future left in Australia, unfortunately. I know we're better off than a lot of other, other countries, but our potential is great. These men aren't going to... Um, help us at all. And you don't think, think either of them has the answers, no. even though they're telling mm. us desperately in their commercials oh, that they look, do? Andrew Peacock's policy speech the other night was slick. I, I mean, it was just disgusting. It was sickening and disgusting. It was... Um, I'm, I'm actually very disappointed because I was always very political as a youngster. Now I'm not. I don't really care. I know that's horrible. A lot of people will probably shoot me. But I really don't care. Mm. I don't care anymore. Yes, uh, you, your point? find that I'm in a muddle over it because I don't feel I can trust what they're saying. The statement we just watched of Andrew Peacock, I feel that he can understand about the rich getting richer, but I really feel he's out of touch about the poor getting poorer. 
and whereas um, certainly Hazel was a big plus, perhaps she should be Prime Minister, uh, <laughs> she's a big plus for Mr Hawke and his family in perhaps keeping him in touch and he's perhaps had a fair go at it but for instance when I received a um, $1.20 a fortnight increase in my family allowance at the end of the last year, which with two children gives me an extra 30 cents to assist and ensure that my children are not in poverty this year. I don't feel that he's doing a good job either, but I don't like the alternative because I don't believe that that man's in touch with the community. I can see the difficulties that you're going through in your minds. I think we better move on and put this to an instant vote, if you will. It's a very simple question, this one, I think, and you'll probably have some difficulty coming to terms with it, given what you've just had to say to me. But this is our question. Which of the parties is best able to manage the problems of the economy? Labor, Liberal National Coalition, Democrats, or some other? As I say, it's a simple question. Which of the parties do you think is best able to manage the problems of the economy? And here's our result. Uh, so the Liberals have come out, the Liberal National Coalition has come out with 50%. That's, that's an interesting result. I suppose um, it would be interesting to um, uh, see if the result would change after the Labor Party policy speech tomorrow night, because as people have pointed out, we still have only had one set of policies. But uh, by a narrow margin, you, you've sort of said here as a group anyway that you think the Coalition is worth a go. You wanted to make a point on that? I wonder whether um, the Liberal and the Labor voters here, or the Australian community as a whole, accept that times are going to be tough for Australia economically, no matter which party you vote in. As somebody said before, you're either playing it off against high interest rates or high taxation, that you're playing one off against the other. I'm interested if people think as a whole that economic times are going to stay tough due to industry restructuring and various other things where Australia is... Do you all recognise that? The times are going to stay tough. It, it's difficult and it's a question you find. Yes, John Cowell, perhaps you'd make a final point and we'll move on. Right, Peter. <clears throat> One of the things that happens with a complex issue like the economy is that, that those who don't understand all the complexities want an interpreter. And that role has usually been in the media. And I know I've got Jeff sitting just one right away from me. But I wonder if the media so far has done a good enough job in explaining to the people what the policies of the, the two parties are all about. And helping people and make helping up their people minds. To come to grips. It's a they, difficult one, Jeff. It is. I think, uh, in my observation of this election campaign, and this is the seventh I've, federal campaign I've observed, I think the coverage of the economic issues is more detailed and more exact than it's probably been in any other campaign. I think uh, because there aren't any... I mean, all the policies basically have been announced. There's been a lot of discussion tonight about the Labor Party policy launched tomorrow night, but the reality is that the Labor Party basically launched its policies with the economic statement a couple of weeks ago. So you're not expecting any many well, new be, initiatives? No, no. There'll <laughs> be something on childcare. Somebody mentioned that earlier. Yeah. There'll be a few bits and pieces that may appeal to, uh, to the, the fringes of politics, but it seems from what we've seen that people do want to make up their minds on the economic issues. If you just make a final comment, then I want to talk about the environment as an issue. Well, I wanted to go on to the um, issue of education, Peter. I'll, okay, just if you just make a quick point, we've only got about five minutes left. Well, I'd just like to urge voters to pay more attention to what the parties are promising in regard to education. You're obviously a teacher, are you? No, I'm not. I'm a parent. Right. And I think that the whole issue of education is very um, underdeveloped. There's not much debate going on about it at all. It hasn't had much a of a mention this campaign. No, it certainly has not. And it's a fact that... Uh, an increasing proportion of voters don't have children in school anymore, but I would just urge voters, whether they've got children in the system or not, to ask more probing questions about education. After all, the kids are the future of this nation. And we have to demand better performance from both parties in that regard. OK. Well, the other issue that's certainly emerging as a, as, as a very strong issue in this campaign, and certainly both the parties, major parties, seem to think it is, is the environment and who's best able to handle the problems of the environment. Now, I think we should... Uh, well, once again, we're getting very conflicting claims through the party television ads. You know, things like this we're seeing almost every night now on television. <laughs> The Hawke government legislated to safeguard world heritage areas like Uluru and the Daintree rainforests. The same government is leading a world campaign to protect and preserve the Antarctic. It was the previous Liberal-led government which set aside the Kakadu, Uluru and Great Barrier Reef National Parks. It was the Liberals who banned whaling. 
Yes, now they're, they're, they're a born-again greenies for you. Now, they're both great for the environment. They discovered the environment. What do you think of all this? I mean, I, we're talking about... that. We're, talk, we're including the Democrats in this. You know, as you know, the Australian Conservation Foundation and the Wilderness Society has now come out and endorsed the Democrats directly. But what do you, what do you make of the, of the sort of claims that are being made to, uh, to greenness in this campaign? I think they're actually... Um, the two parties are actually making people a bit more cynical about themselves because all of a sudden they've become green. And whereas other people are maybe gradually becoming um, more aware of the environment, they've just jumped on the bandwagon. Do you distrust them? Oh, dreadfully. On the environment? Yep. I think when it comes to the environment, it's such an important issue that I don't care if they're just doing it to get my vote, so long as they're protecting the environment. I mean, I don't mind what their method is, just so long as, at the end of the day, we have a protected environment. You're all saying they. Do you have any uh, clear notions at this stage about who, you, which of the parties you think is most committed to the environment and would do best for the environment? Yes, I'll let you finish. Well, I think um, we were talking about commentators before. And I think the best indication was that it was yesterday when the Australian Conservation Foundation came out and supported the Democrats first and gave their second preference to Labor. I think mm. if you're looking for guidance on issues such as the environment, then you look to the people who really know what they're talking about. Was that about. an influence on you, or had you decided that anyway before yesterday? I think primarily I'd already decided, but I think that, that sealed my, my mm. vote. Right, yes, you've been trying to make a point. Yes, I think that uh, the, the Labor par Party, certainly out of the two parties, has shown a, a more consistent uh, and, and better attitude towards the environmental policies. I think the Liberal Party has just virtually recently joined the ranks as far as the environment uh, policies of this country are concerned. Uh, it hasn't had much of a, a good reputation in that regard in the past. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'll let you make a final point before we have the vote on this. I don't think either the Liberal or the Labor Party's taken the environment seriously enough. I mean, the economy for me powers into insignificance next to the environment because within 30 or 40 years, neither Hawk or Peacock are going to be around. It's going to be us that have to pick up the mess. I mean, take World Heritage, for example. I mean, if the two words make sense to you, the whole world should be a World Heritage area. I mean, if it's just going to be forests and and areas mm. like Kakadu. I mean, what's wrong with putting the ozone layer on the World Heritage listing? That makes sense. Uh, it's to interesting me. to me because, you know, we've got these massive economic problems, but you have speaking most passionately tonight about the environment. You see this is the future. You seem to... Well, you're saying that you can't understand necessarily a lot of the economic problems, but these are something that can be surmounted. The environment is something that we have to make a long-term commitment to. So then who is going to be best? This is going to be such an issue when you vote on uh, Saturday the 24th. Who is going to be best to handle the situation? have my doubts about Labor's commitment to the environment because they're constantly chopping and changing the rules. And whether we like it or not, we need to strike a reasonable balance between protecting the environment on one hand and maintaining some sort of industrial base on the other. I mean, Sydney's beaches are a mess. We have to clean them up. We have some major pollution problems. But the fact of the matter is the government has jumped around like a cat on a hot tin roof. And just on the point that some other people were making, in the days when the environment was not very fashionable, Malcolm Fraser, a Liberal Prime Minister, stood up to a rather right-wing Sir Joe Bajoki Peterson and banned sand mining on Fraser Island. Now, he copped an awful lot of stick for that. That was a long time before the environment was trendy. All right, well, let's put this to a vote now. And it's a very simple question once again, I think, uh, when you have to come down and consider it very carefully. Which of the parties is best able to manage the problems of the environment? Labor, the coalition, the Democrats, or maybe some other group? We're talking about the green independence, independence of various other uh, configurations. Which of the parties do you think is best able to manage the problems? And by a long short, you've said the Democrats with 49%. Is this likely to be a strong influence in your vote on the 24th? Just give me an indication. Uh, y yes, with, quite, yes with, with hands, quite a few of you. Okay. Let's, because we're running very tight on time now, I, I think I should uh, get you to give us a final vote, if you will. Now, as I said, I know at the beginning you indicated that 36% of you haven't made up your minds, but uh, perhaps some of you have formed some opinions after the discussion tonight. If, the question is this, and if you'll give us your vote, if an election were being held tonight, who would get your first preference? If an election were being held tonight, who'd get your first preference? Labor, the Liberal National Coalition, Democrats, or other? Who'd get your first preference if you had to vote in an election tonight? 
And there we are, Labor 33, Liberal 41, Democrats 24. That's a very interesting result from this group. Maybe what we should do is uh, conduct a quick follow-up poll and do what they'll have to do on the 24th, I've no doubt, and distribute preferences. Could I just get those of you who did not vote for either Labor or Liberal, just to give us another quick indication. And the question this time is this. For those of you who did not vote for either Labor or Liberal National Coalition, who, will get your, who would get your second preference if you were voting in an election tonight? And once again, this is just for people who uh, voted for Democrats or others in that last polling. Who would get your second preference? Here we go. So Labor would get 37, Liberals 33, and Independents and others about 30. Well, Max Yan, I'm not good enough at mathematics to distribute those preferences, <laughs> but I would, at a rough guess, how would you place it? At a rough guess, I would, I would give the preference of this group the Coalition. It will, in fact, just be marginally ahead of the, uh, for the Coalition, I suspect, with the, the, the even split on the last uh, Democrats. Do you want to make a final yes, point? Yes, well, I think... Uh, what was interesting about that was there's still a large undecided vote. Mm. So that means what happens in the rest of the campaign is going to be very important. Yes. The other thing forcing was, people to make it Exactly. The other thing was that the Democrats' preferences didn't go 60-40 to Labor. No, they, they seemed to go not. the other way. Mm. And that would be a big la worry for the Labor Party, I would think. Very much so. Yes, I mean, it, it certainly uh, that the last mm. days of this campaign are going to be absolutely crucial if 37% uh, of you still haven't made up your minds until then. And uh, certainly on that sort of polling, we could very well end up with a minority government in Canberra on March the 25th. But thank you all very much for coming along tonight and for letting us hear what you're thinking, because uh, regrettably, voters tend to get overlooked in election campaigns. It's all about you, but you're the ones that get overlooked. Thank you for coming along and telling us what you think tonight. And... Uh, just quickly before we finish off, I want to thank you for all your letters and the phone calls you've made about last week's program on the multifunction polis. The overwhelming consensus from you was that this program was far too short and you want to know more. But we've got the message. We are tentatively scheduling another program for later in the year, probably around about June, when a, a, a specific site is to be nominated for this multifunction polis. But um, unfortunately, we're not going to be doing anything much for the next three weeks because we're being taken off air for three weeks. Uh, the program schedulers assure me that we'll be back on air on Wednesday the 4th of April. Uh, we're planning an evening with David Suzuki on that night, the controversial Canadian uh, environmentalist. Uh, he has many followers in Australia, as I'm sure you know, but there will be people taking part in that program who believe he's on the wrong, wrong track. It should be an interesting night. That'll be... April the 4th. So I hope you won't forget us between now and then, and we'll all get together again on Wednesday, April the 4th. Until then, good night.